Mike was sitting there behind me. He's like, oh, hey, I made a mistake. I gave, I gave Abby the wrong verse. It's 2214, not 2114. All right. Revelation 2214. It says, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Amen. All right, I will now turn it over to Mike. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. Happy Sabbath. What, a, what an invigorating day <laughs> to step outside and uh, just, uh, just feel that cold air. We have a new puppy. Uh, Lori has a new puppy, but it's interesting. One person gets a new puppy. It's everybody's puppy. So I was uh, taking the poor little thing out and uh, so he could go out back and, and do his business and boy, he was really quick today. Uh, there, was, there, was no, there was no dilly, dilly dally around at all. So I thought, yeah, I'm okay with this weather actually. Uh, but it is, uh, it is definitely nice to, uh, to be able to get out. You know, um, we, uh, so I made, I've got a couple of slides here. Everybody's probably sitting there going, what is this? Which reminds me, I need to get charged up here and uh, get this thing going. So slides, yeah, I, I uh, have a couple of things that's best if I show them off of a slide. But um, as a little bit of a, a background, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go to a place here in Charleston, South Carolina here, and I'm gonna show you a picture. Um, Lori and I used to go to Charleston um, every year uh, for, for our anniversary. And one of the years, the first time that we had gone there, um, we were walking around, we were talking to someone at the hotel, the concierge, and they were saying, oh, and one of the things to do while you're here is we have a uh, tour of uh, gardens. And it's of some of the homes that are around there. And if you've ever been to Charleston, the homes are just amazing. Every time, every time I see some of these big, beautiful mansions, I think, well, I wonder what God's got in store for me because this looks awesome, <laughs> you know. So, so what's, what he's got for me has got to be even better, you know, which is, which is crazy because it's hard for me to imagine that people could live like that, let alone how we're going to live throughout eternity, amen. That is, that is going to be fantastic. And so uh, I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to see some of these gardens. Lori was all excited about it. And uh, they said, okay, well, um, we can sell tickets for you here, um, you know, and it's on, it's on Sabbath. And so we said, ah, you know, probably, probably not then. We didn't, we felt bad about just uh, paying the money and stuff for, for Sabbath. So um, Lori and I were out walking around the city and uh, kind of looking at the different houses. Lori, I think this is the trip where uh, she was really interested in what is behind the gates, which are these gardens. And so I was afraid I was going to be arrested because she she would she would get up right up against the little gaps in the in the fence or in the in the gates and look through to see what the gardens were like behind you know so she really wanted to see these well we were walking over to see this house and this uh, this it was a couple and their daughter um, we ran into them and for some reason we started talking we we're kind of going in the same direction they they had this map and they said we're looking for the such and such house and i said yeah i think we're going down that way too um, and so they go are you uh, are you on the tour of gardens and i said no no we're not we're not doing that and talked to them a little bit and they said well it's really great said hey we've got some extra tickets would you like them and so it just goes to show you, you know, that the Lord rewards your faithfulness. We ended up going in to see a house that had not been, the gardens had not been opened up to the public in decades. Uh, so it was really a special treat. And the things that you get to see are just amazing. Um, but one year when we were there, we got to see, uh, we walked past this house. It's out on Laguerre Street. Um, and it is known as the Sword Gate House. And so there is a picture of this gate. <clears throat> um, the Sword Gate is named uh, after, from the fact that you'll see, and it's kind of hard to see, uh, I probably should have blown this up a little bit more. It looks huge on my monitor. Um, 
but there's a there is a spear in the center that goes that goes straight up vertically and then horizontally right about that midpoint there are these two swords that face toward the uh, toward the inside of it right so it's called the sword gate and the sword gate house um, it's interesting that of all the homes when you're walking through there no other gates are named this gate is named because of its uniqueness. Um, it's also meant, of course, as a gate, is meant to keep people out. That wall that you see going around, it was, has been there since 1818, um, and guests would come in and out the front. You didn't want guests, you closed the gate, of course, right? It has this unique design, just like I mentioned, those two swords, and the interesting part of it is that it wasn't really meant for a residence. Um, in the 1830s, and I'm giving you a history lesson, so everybody's probably like, ah, oh, you know. So in the 1830s, the city of Charleston went to this, uh, this, this metal smith and told, them, told him that they wanted two gates for their police station, okay? The, uh, the guy that was, that was banking the gates said, oh, well, okay, so they wanted two sets of gates. And so he made two sets of gates, delivered them to the city, and they said, no, 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 you, you misunderstood. We need two gates, you know, one on each side, you know, just they, they both open two, not, not two sets. And so here he was, he was stuck with this other set, held on to him for about 20 years, and the owner of this mansion needed a set of gates, he liked them, so he, he bought them, okay? Um, and it wasn't really meant for a, a residence. Um, so, when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know what, we're, there are some gates that one day we can go through. And we find out about those gates in Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 to 13. In Revelation chapter 21, John again is carried off into vision. And he says this, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and the gates, and at the gates, twelve angels, and names were written on them, which were the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The interesting part about this is these gates were named, just like the, like the sword gates, but they're named after the 12 tribes, but the question is, um, according, to, according to what list? Um, there are several listings throughout scripture of the tribes, and some of them, uh, are, uh, are, are different. So what would be the list that we would have to concern about? Would it be by birth? Okay, sons of Israel are listed by birth, as you see right there. And along with, uh, along with their, the orders, also the, what their name means. And that's gonna come up a little bit later. Why is that significant? So Reuben, of course, was the first, uh, all the way down to Benjamin being the youngest. There are 12 sons total, and there were 12 gates in New Jerusalem that are going to be named after each one of the 12 tribes. But which one would it possibly, which one could we possibly be looking at? Well, excuse me. <laughs> um, According to, is it, is it the one by birth, or is it according to Ezekiel chapter 48, there's actually two uh, listings of the tribes in Ezekiel chapter 48. The first one is according to the division of the lands, so is it that one? Then you go to the last part of Ezekiel 48, and there's, there's a list of, it says that the holy city has 12 gates, there's three on each side, and it names all the gates. Would it be that listing? Well, most likely, it is isn't uh, either one of those, we would have to go back for a list from the 12 tribes in the book of Revelation, and that's found in Revelation chapter 7, where the 144,000 are listed. So if you look through this list, you will notice that um, the, the order, or excuse me, not the order, but the names are pretty much the same until you get down to the, to the fifth one. 
And if it's listed by birth, you see that Dan is listed, but if they're the ones that's listed in 144,000, you see the name Manasseh substituted for Dan. And you have to ask yourself, why, why, is, why is that? Well, there is, there's one, uh, a couple of books that I've read um, say that it is important that Dan was not included um, because in, um, excuse me, I have to find my text here now, Judges chapter 18, verses 30 and 31, the whole tribe of Dan apostatized and fell into idol worship. And as you know, the, the main issue in this great controversy between Satan and God revolves around worship. And so the idea is that Dan was excluded from this list uh, because the whole tribe fell into, uh, fell into idol worship. And it's interesting, as you read through Scripture, Dan still comes up into the list of the tribes, but it's kind of like that family member, you know, has, who has done something that's notable that nobody ever really talks about, you know, and it's kind of off to the side. That's how, that's how the tribe of Dan was. Um, so it may be, it may be that. Um, but as I looked through this list, I thought most likely it's because of what his name means. If you look at it, Dan means to judge. And um, the judgment is over. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. If you go back just a little bit here, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, it says, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from, whom is, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. It says, and the sea gave up their dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the judgment has already been done, okay? So I'm thinking it's most likely that we don't need to mention anything to do with judgment. Instead, it is very appropriate that we put Manasseh, who is one of Joseph's sons, he had Manasseh and Ephraim, and they're listed every once in a while, like the division of land that I was talking about, they're listed in there. Um, so it would be appropriate to bring Manasseh in because his name means making to forget. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, if you go down just a few verses, it reminds me of this. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Isn't it just like God to put a name in the list that shows that we are, we are forgetting everything that has passed? All of the bad stuff is over. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Make Making me to forget, I, I am getting at the point in my age where it's very easy to, for me to forget. And I really don't like it because it makes me think that I'm getting old. Well, I guess it reminds me that I'm getting older. And it's hard for me to think that I am looking forward in the, throughout eternity to be given the gift of not being able to remember, okay? But that's going to happen. And so it's very appropriate that we put Manasseh in there instead of Dan. Uh, let me see. So, here we go. Um, here is, so, so the order in which these are, are given gives us another message. So, here is the order. And it's not according to birth, and it's different from the order that is listed anywhere else in Scripture. So we have Judah listed first, which means let God be praised. Reuben, which is, ne which is next, he was the firstborn, means a son. Gad is, means fortune. Asher means happy. Naphtali means my wrestling. Manasseh means making to forget, as we said. Simeon is hearing. Levi is joined. Issachar is man of hire. Zebulun dwelling. Joseph may God add. And Benjamin, son of the right hand. 
Now, there are some scholars that have looked at this and they said, there's a reason why we have this order. God has called them out in a particular order because he's trying to convey a message. What is that message? Praise God, a son, a fortune of sons, redeemed and blessed, victorious after wrestling in prayer, forgetting self in the past, hearing God's call, joined to God as servants, dwelling with added joys and blessings as sons of the right hand of God. Isn't that amazing? That he used the names to convey what is the gospel. Praise God. He has, he has saved us. How did he save us? He saved us through giving a son, his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And through him and through what he has done, it's not just a victory, but a multitude of victories, a fortune of victories, of sons and daughters that will fill the new Jerusalem, that will be able to be reunited with him. It is more than one. It is a great blessing, a fortune indeed. How are they happy and blessed because what God has done? You know, you look at the Beatitudes and it says, blessed, blessed, blessed. That means happy, happy, happy. Those are the people that are following God. We are, we are blessed through what he has done for us. And what is it that he has done? Well, we have wrestled with self. We have wrestled with sin. We have come to him through prayer. We have come to him as, as, uh, as people needing the great grace that only he can give. And we wrestle with these things through prayer. We are victorious forgetting the past, forgetting self in the past, the things that we have done, which could be pretty bad. Those things are all gone. It's interesting when you look at this list too. I mean, this, these guys were not, were not really all that great. I mean, if you look at Reuben, Reuben committed immorality that was embarrassing to the family, okay? Um, if you look at Levi and Simeon, they were murderers and thieves. If you look at the tribe of Benjamin, they were at a point where they were so immoral that in one of their cities, there's an account in Judges chapter uh, 19, that they were just like Sodom. There ended up being a civil war where the other tribes came against Benjamin and almost wiped them out. They were down to 600 survivors, and that was it. They'd almost wiped out the whole tribe because of what they had done. Read through that account, and you, you see that it's, it's very similar to what you read in Genesis chapter 19. Almost exactly the same story as when the angels came to Sodom and got Lot and his family out. I mean, these people weren't perfect. And you look at the list and you realize what they've done and you think, hallelujah, God is offering salvation to everyone no matter what you have done. And these people did some really bad things. But praise God, through his son, through all of these things, we can be victorious and we can forget whatever it is that we may have done. Because he forgets. And there is, out of love now, it says, hearing God's call, we respond to God's call because he wants to add to that fortune. He wants to add to those people that are in his kingdom. We, be, we, we respond to that call of service, and we are joined to God then as his servants, doing his will. Not because we're trying to obey, but because out of love for him and being touched from love for, for him and having his love in us, it is just our natural thing to do. You know, we hear sometimes some people do something. Have you ever heard somebody do something and it's just really maybe not socially acceptable or, or even, even just, just bad? And they, they may say, well, that's just how I am. Have you ever heard somebody say that? That's just how I am. We will be so in harmony with God and having his love in us that obedience is just how I am. 
There's, there's nothing, I, I am who I am. And I am who I am because of who God is. Amen? Okay. And what is, the, what is our reward? We will, we, will dwell in, we will dwell then with added with joys and blessing that only God himself can add as sons of the right hand of God. Join heirs with Jesus as you travel this sod. Amen? Amen. This, as we read through this, we see the gospel in a nutshell. We see the gospel that is all spelled out. We can only enter the holy city because of what God has done for us. And it's interesting that the New Jerusalem actually has gates facing in every direction. When I read through this, when I read through this, reminded me of Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, where Jesus said, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. By having gates on every side, God is showing us that anyone, anyone that is saved from any nation, tribe, tongue, or people can enter the new Jerusalem salvation is for all. And so also we see in the layout here, we also see in the layout that the gates are special. A lot like, I, I paralleled this from what I saw with the sword gate actually. It's really interesting to me in the parallels for this. The, the gates have a unique construction in the New Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 21 says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. But the, the, the gates themselves are 12 pearls. Those have to be huge pearls that would, that would be sitting there at the gate. And as I thought about this, I was remembered about the parable in Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46, Jesus said, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Isn't it worth everything that we have to be able to enter those gates? Those gates that are of a, of a pure, as a pure pearl, wouldn't I sell everything that I have, everything that I am, everything that I want to be able to gain that pearl of great price, that entrance of great price? But you know what? I have to surrender, but the price has already been paid. That great price was paid to assure that you and I can be able to be there and see and walk through the gate of pearl. And it's interesting then also, we talked about the sword gate, you know, keeping people out. The New Jerusalem's gates are not necessary to keep people out. Revelation chapter 1, verses 25, or 21, verses 25 to 27. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. To be able to gain entrance, we have to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Anyone who's not there will not be admitted. Anyone who clings to any sin will not be able to walk through those gates. Only only those people, it says, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, nothing unclean. And there will be nothing that is unclean. All of the other things are passed away, so there's no need for the gates to be closed. There's no need for any kind of protection. And it's always daytime there, so you're not going to be, you're not going to be scared of anything that might be going on at night. The gates are always open. The offer of salvation is always open. It never closes. We can always be of those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Very soon, brothers and sisters, we 
I have the opportunity to see these fantastic gates. I seriously think it's closer than you might even think. Maybe even, as Jesus says, even at the door. Very soon we will be able to walk in if we truly love our God more than anything else. And our desire is to be with him. In a little while, this is going to happen. In a little while, we're going home. I'm going to ask that you all stand with us as we sing number 626, our closing hymn, number 626. In a little while, we're going home. <laughs> 